so I was going to say thank you for that strong, non-traditional, super swell introduction that I actually wrote, yes. And I, I did it because I wanted to highlight my deep roots as a, a Tucsonan and as a Arizona Wildcat and note that although you can take the boy out of the Tucson, you can never ever take Tucson or the Arizona Wildcat out of the boy. Um, so it's it really is sweet and joyful to be here in Tucson in person um, and, and to see some lifelong wonderful friends and to have the opportunity to represent my family and say a few words about our parents, Fred, and Fred Borga of blessed memory and, and Barbara Borga, and also share a few remarks about the creation uh, of the fund. And really, the Endowed Fund for us has been a beautiful opportunity to give back in some small measure, uh, make a contribution in return for the amazing gifts and blessings that we received in and through our parents and, and through this amazing university. And truly, I can say that already we've lived the experience that it is better to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive as we've maintained and deepened our connections to this town and university. I've had the pleasure of engaging with Dean AP, who I call the uh, Lute Olson of the Humanities, the Lute Olson Dorrance Dean of the Humanities. I mean, this guy's a rock star, you know? And then Dr. Seat's been so gracious, and and uh, I've just met Caleb, who's, who's really impressive and wonderful guy, and of course, Michelle, it's been such a nice to develop the friendship with you. Um, but really, most importantly, most powerfully, I've had the, the pleasure and joy to interact a bit with some of the scholarship recipients um, through Zoom or through phone calls. And as I mentioned in the, in the video, really, really amazingly impressive young people, um, you know, genuine, uh, sincere, academically, just, you know, really powerful and it's it's real sparks of light and so it revs me up so much it boosts my hope that maybe we do have a, a, you know a future ahead of us that might be one we want to look forward to um so just a little you know is why you might say did we choose the college of humanities um um, for our gift, and it ha relates to my kind of lifelong interest in the intersection and integration of faith and healing, and faith and medicine, religion and medicine. Um, and just to, you know, discuss that a little bit, unpack, uh, unpack that a bit, I'm just going to share a few vignettes from our story, which you may have slightly heard of uh, from the video. But uh, First scene is 1971, Toledo, Ohio. I'm walking down a Catholic, the aisle of a Catholic church carrying a ring. My Jewish mother is, is standing up there. And Fred, this wonderful guy who's come into our life. Uh, now I knew as Fred from my earliest memories, wonderful guy. They're getting married and um, slightly confusing. So there's a little bit of doctrinal, you know, dilemma, but you might think of it more as kind of a, a faith mosaic type of situation. Um, but nevertheless, we have a bl brand new blended family and, and everything's just, just peachy keen and all is well, except for the fact that the littlest of the family is, keeps trying to die with uh, intractable, chronic, severe asthma. And uh, after going to all the greatest specialists, they send him up to Ann Arbor to see the pediatric allergist who says, you know, this is a situation we can't solve. I think you should send you know, this, your son to the Denver Jewish home for asthmatics, which you might you think about as kind of a Jewish sleepover camp for asthmatics that you never leave. You come in and you, don't, you stay there two years. And I say that seriously because they advocated parentectomy, literally meaning that you were completely, I'm not making this up. You, their, their idea was you separated completely the parents from the kid. Um, another example of how often in medicine we get it wrong, conventional wisdom, but that's another story. Um, strangely, my parents did not elect that option. They elected option number two, um, suggested by this specialist, which was to come to Tucson. And, and as parenthetically, the specialist number two was the fourth dean of this medical school, a guy named Neil Vanslow. 
who subsequently came to Arizona two years after we got here. But nevertheless, my parents, in their first act of sacrificial love and incredible courage, uh, sold everything they have, which was not much, um, said goodbye their entire life and all their family. My dad packed his brand new family into a Buick Electra 225 and repossessed from the insurance company, Canary Yellow. He, he planted a metallic blue. It was pretty cool. And we take, we begin the trek across the, the, um, country. And by a series of fortunate events, some might call serendipity or coincidence, some might consider divine providence. We narrowly avoid the clutches of the evil northern kingdom with their devil-worshipping sun people or sudden devil-worshipping people, whatever they are up there, the devils and the forks. And we land here in the southern kingdom in Zion at the old Pueblo. Thank God. And right away, my dad, my dad immediately starts attending the Newman Center, uh, going to mass uh, religiously. <laughs> um, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, we met. That's where I met uh, Father Burns, uh, incredible guy. Um, but but at the same time, my parents had this idea that we should be raised Jewish, which we were. So we were part of a Jewish shul. I was provided Jewish education. I became bar mitzvah, as did my brother. My sister became bat mitzvah. Um, so we grew up in the midst of this dis dissonance between the Catholic faith tradition and a Jewish faith tradition. But really what stood out for me was there was something different about my dad. He was a different kind of cat. I mean, And I mean that in the way that he conducted his life. I alluded to it in the video. He was just... He was rock solid. He was not fancy or flamboyant anyway. He was simple and sincere. And when he said something, it was always the right thing at the right time and the right tone. Um, and I'll just share one thing he would say. He goes, my sister would say, well, why did this happen? You say everything happens for a reason. And why? what's the good that comes out of this? And he would say, I don't know yet. Now, if any of you are scripturally based, you might think that echoes somewhat. I see through a glass darkly, uh, but I will see later. I will see face to face. I know, no, I know now in part. Later, I will know in full as I will be known. So he had some profound, profound beliefs, and he had deep faith. And the question for me is, faith in what? Faith in who? Faith in one God? Faith in the Trinity? Uh, it was doctrinally a lot of confusion. Meanwhile, on the Jewish side, I was developing a real strong basis in Jewish guilt which I've maintained, and a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of knowledge, superficial knowledge of, of you know, the, the Torah, but not so much the, the prophets and the writings, and certainly not the Mishnah and the Midrash and the Talmud. And, and, and certainly we were not in any way conventional uh, cultural Jewish family. Now, uh, you know, we didn't really con connect with the Jewish synagogue and we didn't really so there's a lot of disconnected this uncertainty um, um, so the next little vignette I want to bring you to is um, 1983 uh, across the street maybe 102 yards on January 1st uh, I'm on the trauma room of uh, UMC Medical Center my dad and I have been racked up pretty good he had his neck broken and um, I'm laying on my back, bleeding out um, in this scene of fear and trembling and, and chaos and some somewhat, somewhat unimpressive residents and ER doctors, unfortunately. Um, and thinking, you know, my God, I, I don't have eons and eons of time like I thought it, I'm actually going to die. And, you know, with COVID, every, a lot of people have experienced for the first time vulnerability. I would say for those of us in medicine, and those of us who had experiences as patients, it, we're all vulnerable. <laughs> we're all vulnerable. Uh, we see tragedy a lot in what we do day to day. Um, and I'll just tell you, when you're 18, 19 years old, thinking you're going to die, all those questions that you might not, you know, of life and death and heaven and hell and and uh, should I take these claims, claims seriously? And what does it all mean? And they go, through, they go through your mind, that's for sure. Now, in the midst of this, 
In walks Charles Zukowski of blessed memory, who saved my life. He was a surgeon at University of Arizona, came in, took care of things, but he gave me a lesson in being a physician that I've never forgotten. He walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, bent down, so he's at eye level and said, Ross, I'm Dr. Zukowski, you've got some bleeding, we need to take you to the OR and take care of it, you're gonna be fine, we're gonna take care of you. And those five seconds, those five seconds, the comfort he provided me, I can't really quantitate. And, and for those that don't believe in this mind-body you know, connection, let me tell you, there's mind-body connection. I guarantee you my thought patterns shifted, that I'm sure my adrenal squeeze shifted a bit, my physiological parameters shifted. Um, uh, very impactful. And he provided me this lesson about how to speak to somebody genuinely, how to be there in the moment. And uh, it reminded me in my practice that in medicine, we aim to cure sometimes, um, uh, relieve often, but comfort always. And that is actually attributed to Amboise Pair, who was a barber surgeon for the Valois dynasty. Did I say Valois, right? Maybe. In, this, in the uh, mid 16th century. And I think one of the, th in, in medicine, I mean, we all love the major advances in the technology, but we, we, we're losing a bit the healing arts aspect. We do this, we need the humanities to help remind us that we, we're dealing with another human being. Now, that, maybe that seems obvious and, you know, self evident, but let me tell you, every day there are examples where we fall so short in that regard. So, summing it up somewhat. Um, so my interest in this, the faith and healing and, and, and uh, religion and medicine, there's obviously not unique to me. These are lifelong questions that, the, that uh, great men, great men and women and thinkers have pondered forever. They, they, it's really a subset of the, these greater questions of what's the meaning of life and, and how, what connects us all together and how can we get along with one another, even if we're very different. Um, and I find these, uh, these, these, I find it very fascinating to study these things. And I, I recognize, you know, if you go back to Tertullian, I like this phrase, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Now, Tertullian is a Christian apologist, and he didn't want the revelation to be muddied by the philosophers. He didn't want, he didn't want Plato and the Stoics to come in and create heresies. So there was that line of thing. And then you get to uh, Clement and Origen and Augustine, and they are more, let's synthesize. Let's take some of the learnings of the, the philosophers, and, and there is some divine light, um, you know, through human rational thought, and, and blend that in. And that carried forward into, you know, the Scholastics and Aquinas and Maimonides and you know, then you move into the, the age of reason and enlightenment, and uh, uh, we dismiss faith and revelation and God, and gee, you get into some really bleak, some really <laughs> bleak philosophies. I mean, uh, just pick whoever, uh, Nietzsche, he, he didn't know, you know, Nietzsche, if you don't know that his end, he didn't end well. He, um, you know, Schopenhauer, you know, life is uh, a pendulum swinging between boredom, uh, boredom and pain. Well, that's not too pleasant to think about. Jean-Paul Sartre, how do you say it? Is that correct? Yeah. Being or nothing, you know, be being or nothingness, we have to make up meaning because there is no meaning. Very, not really uplifting. Not the kind of movie I want to go see. You know, but then, you know, you read uh, Viktor Frankl, who, you know, who the um, man searched for meaning of Viktor Frankl can't say he didn't have some hard times. He was in two different concentration centers and death camps and talked about it. I think he's quoting Nishka that um, a man can tolerate anything if he, if he has a reason why or something along those lines that, that, that we have to have a meaning to deal with these circumstances. However, then I'm almost done. However, <laughs> then we get to this new, the new ideas where we deconstruct reason and truth 
Uh, and we deconstruct the notion that there's any correspondence between thought and reality to the point where we say to even talk about reason is insanity, which is Michel Foucault. Foucault, correct? And even then, Richard Rorty says, it's, that's not to say that postmodernism is truth or that it offers knowledge, because to assert that would be self-contradictory. So your head's spinning. You can't keep up. But luckily, I have my favorite 20th century philosopher, that, philosopher that, that made it all crystal clear to me. He said, you know, it's so hard to believe in anything anymore. You know, religion, it's so arbitrary, seems so mythological. Yet on the other hand, science is pure empiricism, and by virtue of its method excludes metaphysics. And if it wasn't for my lucky astrology mood watch, I wouldn't believe in anything. So Steve Martin, okay, it's a little crazy, it's a wacky, but here's the point, we are gonna believe in something. And my, my hope would be that we inquire into these beliefs. And my hope is that we would, we would ask the questions and trace the origin of these ideas and maybe even use some empiricism to see what are the results of some of these I ideas. So what did I say? Um, uh, yeah, my hope is that we can still inquire, ask questions, and ponder openly, that we would keep the sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. Stole that from C.S. Lewis. That's great. Sea breeze of the centuries. And perhaps we would not be conformed to this age, but, but, but be, transformed by the, be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we all might learn to live life abundantly. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Um, I have the microphone and I can <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the, the kind introduction for, to, for tolerating that long and long discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, and, and to, I've had the joy of speaking to Dr. Brett Hendrick, Hendrickson, who's here tonight as our guest speaker for the inaugural event of the lecture series. Dr. Hendrickson is an associate pros, professor of religious city, studies at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. He teaches and publishes on religion in America, Mexican-American religion, and the history of healing practices in the United States. He's the author of several books, including Border Medicine, A Transcultural History of Mexican-American Corandarismo. It's amazing. His most recent book is Mexican-American Religions, published with Rutledge in 2021. And following the lecture, we're going to have a panel discussion on health, culture, and religion on the Arizona border. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, very grateful for Dr. Schwartzberg and for the Fred and Barbara Borger lecture series. I'm also grateful for, to the Department of Religious Studies and Classics for inviting me here for this inaugural event. I'm just so pleased to be here. Uh, and, and as sort of a, a prefatory comment, I thought it might be a good idea as well to say why I think humanities-based research and analysis are necessary to the study of medicine and specifically how religious studies and related fields uh, can lend their expertise in, in these discussions. Uh, first, I think that, that we're really good at historical contextualization of both medicine and religion, including engagement with power, uh, agency, identity, and sometimes trauma. Two, I'd say we are experts in analyzing cultural narratives and patterns such as myths, art, customs, rituals, ceremonies, food ways, and kinship networks, and how those relate to understandings of the body, sickness, restoration of health, and balance. And finally, I would say we can make qualitative assessments uh, of how culturally constructed aspects of our identity, such as race, gender, religion, uh, affect notions of health and health outcomes. So just with that Small little preface, I, I just want to say thanks again for this opportunity. I really am pleased to be here. So I wanted to start with this pair of images here. On the right, you'll see the Santo Niño de Atocha, the holy child of Atocha, uh, who is an image of the Christ child, uh, maybe around the years of, you know, somewhere six, seven, maybe 12 years of age. He's dressed like a medieval pilgrim, and uh, in 
the devotion that many Latino people have to the Santo Nino, uh, they believe that in the night, in the night he leaves wherever it is he hangs out in the day, I guess, and he goes out and he takes care of the needy, of the most needy, and particularly of children. He makes sure that they're okay. And when he's going out taking care of people all night long, he wears out his little shoes. And so people who are devoted to the Santo Nino, uh, when they come to shrines to him, and particularly to this shrine I'm showing you here, which is the Santuario de Chimayo in New Mexico, which I'll be talking some about later. And the devotees, they make an offering to the Santo Nino. They make a petition for the safety of their own children by leaving baby shoes for the Santo Nino to wear in his own rounds of care to the community. Uh, and in that petition, they pray also for the safety of their own children, that they'll be held from harm. Uh, and they make a, a promise that if the Santo Nino will keep their children safe, they'll continue with their devotion. The reason I, I share these images is because, for me, these baby shoes gathered at this shrine to the Christ child remind me of, of why I study Mexican-American religious healing. When I study this, uh, just as uh, Ross mentioned, you know, remember the, the human beings at the heart of these stories, of these intersections between religion and healing. I, I see a matrix of healing and protection and devotion for tender and real people. And I always try to keep that foremost in, in my mind when I'm doing my research and teaching on these topics. So tonight, the plan that I have for the talk is to introduce you to three research projects of mine, two that are complete and have resulted in these two books that I've got pictures posted of here, and a third one that I've just started. Um, these three projects have come to occupy three moments in my life as a researcher, and I'm so happy that this talk is allowing me the opportunity to tie them together conceptually and historically, and I hope provocatively. So I will spend some time discussing each project with a focus particularly on the issues I understand to be the most challenging and wide-ranging for the study of Mexican-American religion and medicine. And uh, I will tie those threads together in my conclusion. So let's start then with Mexican-American curanderismo. Uh, curanderismo is a term that refers to several religious and folk healing modalities in the Hispanophone areas of North and South America. It comes from the verb curar, to heal, and the healers in this tradition are called curanderas and curanderos. Uh, it originates with Iberian and Latin American forms of Catholicism, indigenous American health ways, as well as African healing practices which came together in the context of Spain's colonization and evangelization of the Americas. Uh, my research, instead of focusing on the whole hemisphere, has really focused on the Mexican-American forms of curanderismo. And so I want to look now at, at the origins um, of this health tradition. First, we'll start with the Spanish Empire. Um, the state of medicine at the time of the conquest was in no way more advanced in Spain and the Iberian Peninsula and all of Europe than it was anywhere in, in this Western Hemisphere among the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Uh, so we can kind of see where the Spaniards were when they arrived in terms of, of their healing tradition. They contributed to this combination. Uh, like many, Europeans, and for certain around the Mediterranean region, Spaniards typically considered that the, the medical understanding of the body was that it was a humoral system, uh, uh, an idea they had inherited from the Greeks and then later from Muslims uh, who uh, controlled most of the Mediterranean region at the time, including the Iberian Peninsula. And, and the humoral idea, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, is simple. It was one of balance and equilibrium. There were four humors in the body, and if they were in balance, you were healthy, and if they weren't in balance, you were sick. And so uh, if you were suffering from an illness, let's say, that was a cold illness, uh, you would be treated by some sort of hot medicine. Uh, or if, let's say, you had too much blood in your body, too much hot and wet, you would be bloodlet. And these were the ways uh, of restoring balance and, and equilibrium and health to the body. Uh, these medical professionals who 
focused on these humors oftentimes were also priests uh, in the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church had plenty to say about healing as well. And in medieval Europe, in Iberian, in the Iberian Peninsula, the devotion to the saints was, was everything. Uh, it, saints and their relics, saints and their power and their ability to intercede with God allowed for the healing of many different illnesses. And uh, oftentimes a particular saint would be associated with a certain malady or body part. So for example, if you had an eye illness, uh, perhaps you would do some sort of medical treatment to your eyes, some sort of salve or I don't know what. And then you would also pray to Santa Lucia, the saint, the patron of eyes. You know, and that would be a way. Uh, and you can see one of the images I've put up here is an uh, image of the, a text that was written in 1712, um, not too far from Arizona, um, in the northern New Spain by a Jesuit called the Florilegio Medicinal. And throughout this book, uh, the Jesuit who wrote it combines these medicinal treatments with saintly prayers. And those were kind of the one-two punch of healing as far as the Spaniards were concerned. But at the same time, there was popular medicine in Europe that also carried over when the Spanish came. Uh, astrology, uh, the zodiac, knowing when the stars were in a certain place to do certain things that were auspicious for your health. And of course, witchcraft and other forms of magic were also utterly commonplace uh, among the Spanish when they arrived. They came in the early 16th century to the shores of what's now Mexico and Mesoamerica and encountered millions of people who had their own cosmologies and health ways. Um, some of them overlapped, some of them didn't with what the Spanish had in mind in terms of religion and medicine and the human body. Uh, but one of the ways that I think the indigenous people were absolutely ahead of the Spanish was in an, a much, much more complete knowledge of American pharmacopoeia and herb, herbal remedies of the flora of this hemisphere. And so the Spanish were in a race to find out, you know, what were the medicines that were going to work here uh, since they, it took them many years and generations to, to import and plant European pharmacopoeia and medicines. Uh, so they, uh, the, the indigenous people had a very advanced knowledge in that. Uh, one difference I think that we could say is uh, that uh, in many Mesoamerican cultures, uh, there was an idea that the body did not have one soul, as the Catholics believed, but there were different forces inside the body that have often been translated as soul. Uh, and for example, the Aztecs had a three-part soul. Uh, the tonali, which was in your head, the teolia, in your heart, and the iyotl, which was in your liver. And they all had sort of different functions. Uh, and this also, it's not exactly like humor, it's not at all. Uh, but if you had trauma, if you had sickness, parts of your soul or even general whole pieces of it could leave your body, leaving you sick, disoriented, at a loss. And treatment then would often be to invite or coax that broken soul back into your body. Another aspect of Mesoamerican health ways that the Spanish encountered uh, were medical specialists, sometimes referred to as shamans, who would enter trances uh, either sort of through drumming or through hallucinogenic uh, substances, enter a dream world where they would encounter different beings and forces and animals sometimes. And in that dream world, they would uh, find wisdom to bring back to their patients and restore their health. And then finally, I think in a way that they did overlap uh, with the Europeans, that they also had astrological understandings of the world. Uh, we can see here a, a picture from a codex from Mesoamerica that's quite similar to the European image of the zodiac that I showed you, uh, of associating different um, parts of nature and of the cosmos with body parts and healing. And uh, of, as I'm sure many of you also know, a very, very advanced understanding of the calendar uh, and what times of the year were healthy for certain things. Now, a catalyst that brought together these two, if we want to call them ingredients of religious healing in the Americas was colonial sickness and death. Uh, here is an image from the Florentine Codex of people suffering and dying from smallpox. There was a rush on both sides, I'd say among the Spanish and among the Mesoamerican people to find ways to heal bodies from the overwhelming genocidal levels of sickness and violence that were eliminating Mesoamerican populations. By some estimates, as many as 90% of people died uh, in the first few decades of Spanish conquest. 
And so people were looking for answers, ways to bring whatever knowledge people had to restore health and bring those things together in any way that would be efficacious. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, what often was the last resort for many was deathbed baptism into the Catholic faith, that even if they wouldn't, weren't, would not be healed here, they would find healing uh, in, in, a, in salvation. Well, on a not, not very happy note, I want to fast forward a little bit, a few centuries. Uh, and in the intervening centuries, I can just say that there developed a complex hybrid healing practice that drew on both Catholic and indigenous understandings of the cosmos uh, and understanding of the human body. And these things developed. They spread uh, from middle, the middle of Mexico north, uh, even to where we are now in what, you know, of course, used to be Mexico here in southern Arizona uh, and became part of what I've studied as Mexican-American curanderismo. So what, what do Mexican-American curanderas and curanderos do? Well, there are different types of curanderas, healers. Uh, one kind um, is a partera, which is a, a midwife who helps deliver babies, of course. Uh, another kind is a bone setter, a huesero, huesera. Uh, another specializes in therapeutic massage and in body work. Uh, they're called sobadores or sobadore, sobadoras. And then finally, those who specialize in herbal remedies would be known as yerberas, yerberos. Um, there's a nice picture here of a, a yerberia where they would sell herbs down in South Tucson, though uh, Professor Vargas and I drove by today and it doesn't exist anymore, I'm sad to say, but uh, here it is. Um, what happens when you go to see a curandera? Well, uh, it, you know, there can be many different things that happen, but sort of a typical order of events might be uh, there would be a platica or a chat, a diagnosis where the curandera listens to you, hears what is ailing you, understands the context in which you are suffering from whatever illness you have. Uh, prayers would typically be said for your uh, improvement, prayers of intercession, petition. Uh, it would be common for the curandera to offer you some sort of medicine or a prescription, a receta, that could include both herbal remedies uh, and ritual acts, you know, to take this particular medicine and say these prayers for nine days or whatever set time. And then also it would be very typical for some sort of body manipulation to occur, especially if you're suffering from aches and pains or some sort of other problem in your body. And, and one of those would be, I'd say one a very typical treatment would be the limpia. The limpia, or cleansing uh, in Spanish, um, is a, is a treatment where the curandera or the curandero takes a bunch of herbs or a raw egg or maybe both and rubs them or brushes them against your body from the crown of your head all the way down your limbs, all the way down to your feet. And while she does this, she'll often say prayers for your improvement, uh, whispering things to you, bringing uh, health to you. Uh, and the idea is, there are many different things that Olympia can achieve, but one of them would be if you're suffering from soul loss or a broken soul, that part of your soul has left your body because of trauma, that it will be coaxed back into your body. The other thing that can happen is that the recognition in this health way that the body is surrounded by energy, it's full of energy, and some of that energy can be bad, or you might have had some sort of intrusion into your body of something that's hurting you that could even be a, a, a hex or a... a, a witchcraft of some sort, and that the limpia would cleanse that out of you and remove those things from you, leaving you free from those problems. So as I finish up this little part of the talk, I want to highlight what I consider to be some of the most important issues in the study of Mexican-American curanderismo today. First are, are where, I, I explain what I think are the origins, but there has been debate about this. Uh, the two foremost scholars of curanderismo in the 20th century were probably Robert Trotter and Juan Antonio Chavira, who wrote in 1980s um, a book about curanderismo, and mostly based on research in South Texas. And they wrote, further Native American influences may be revealed to be a part of curanderismo, as more research is done in this area. But as of now, Mexican-American folk medicine seems to have primarily a European and theoretical base, historical and theoretical base. Uh, they didn't consider it to be much of an indigenous practice at all. Well, 
a lot of curanderas and curanderos today don't feel that way. Um, for example, a curandera who was active in Albuquerque, Elena Avila, uh, wrote in 1999 a book she wrote that limpias and soul retrievals have, quote, been an important part of my culture for thousands of years. And she wasn't referring to her European heritage, but to her indigenous heritage as a mestiza. Her mentor was a Mexican curandero from Mexico City named E. Cateotl. And he wrote, even more provocatively, I think, the tradition of Aztec medicine was concealed from the world for more than 468 years, and my father died seven years before we could disclose it. The ancestors had already determined that this time would come in 1989. And so the question of origins then is, is this an indigenous medicine? Is it a European medicine? What, how much did each of those two threads contribute to this combination medicine? And we find modern day practitioners being much more ready and, and wanting to reclaim an indigenous heritage as an important part of this tradition uh, in contrast to earlier research. Another major issue uh, that I've documented in, in my own research is to what extent has curanderismo spread outside of the Mexican American and other Latino communities? Uh, and what are the dynamics of that spread? Uh, so, for example, if you want to become a curandera later tonight, you can go home and uh, log on to uh, several websites, pay a fee, and take a course. And, you know, if you stay up late, you can probably be a curandera by morning. Um, products have always been available, not only within ethnic communities, but if you go to a botanica or a, a yerberia, you can buy. I mean, they're, they're stores. You can buy the, the Materia Medica for this, no problem. Uh, the other thing that we see happening is that curanderas, Mexican-American curanderas, are very much involved in what I've called metaphysical mixing, uh, where they are very eager oftentimes to combine in their own healing tradition, their own religious traditions, other complementary and alternative medicines. Uh, for example, incorporating Reiki or acupuncture or different types of yoga into their own practice. So ultimately, in a nutshell, I would say that Mexican-American curanderas and curanderos have, have generally avoided the questions of appropriation and cultural theft that have been at the heart of discussions of the outside use of indigenous traditions. They've always been much more open to that kind of sharing and combination. However, I think that issues are starting to crop up, especially as more of an indigenous heritage is claimed for curanderismo, is whose tradition is this? Who's, whose is it? And who can use it? Can anyone use it? Or should it remain within the bounds of an ethnic community as a particular ethnic marker and ethnic religious tradition? All right, part two. I wanna to move to the project I've done about the Santuario de Chimayo. Some of you may have visited it. It is uh, a church in Northern New Mexico in the village of Chimayo. It is the largest site of Catholic pilgrimage in the United States. It's a little village in New Mexico. Um, it's not in North America. That would definitely be the uh, Basilica of Guadalupe in, in Mexico City. Wait, blows it out of the water. But uh, this is the largest site of Catholic pilgrimage in the United States. What makes it so special is that in one of the side rooms of the church, of the Santuario, there's a, there is dirt in the floor. And people gather that dirt, and they've used it for centuries now to heal their illnesses. They rub it on themselves. Sometimes they eat it. Uh, you can see here in the sacristy of the church, people have thrown off their crutches after being healed from visiting the church. And today, uh, nowadays, 2021, over 300,000 people visit the Santuario every year, and it has become a site that combines religious devotion, ethnic maintenance, and tourism. Lots and lots of tourism. Most of the visitors to the shrine today, I say, are tourists. As I talked about the origins of curanderismo, I want to talk about what are the origins of the santuario. And I'll start with what I would call the official story. It's official because this is what the Catholic Church will tell you what the story is. Uh, in 1810, the sunset years of New Spain and the Spanish Empire, a landowner in Chimayo named Bernardo Abeita was praying in his field and he saw a light coming out of the dirt. And he went over to the hole and he found in it a crucifix, ostensibly the crucifix that now is in the main altar at the front of the church. 
And I'll show you a little close-up of that. Uh, he was amazed. He was, Why is there a crucifix? And so he, there was no church at the site at the time, so he carried the crucifix eight miles down the road to the nearest church in a town called Santa Cruz. And the priest received it. was very interested. They put it on the altar in the church. Everybody goes home. The next morning, they go to check on it, and the crucifix is gone. It's not in the church anymore. Goes out in the field. There he is back in the hole. So they're like, this can't be. They, they take the crucifix back to the church eight miles down the road. And Jesus, he comes right on back to the hole. And he does this a couple more times. And uh, finally, they get the idea, you know what? I think Jesus wants a church to be built around him rather than us moving him to a different church. So Abeta builds a church between 18 and 13 and 1816. It becomes the Santuario de Chimayo. And uh, ever since then, people have gone there as pilgrims to get dirt out of the hole that the crucifix came out of. And if you walk down this room, the sacristy on the side of the church, see the little door at the end of the room there, the, the sacristy is full of devotional objects. You get into the hole, the room with a little hole in the ground called the posito, where people take tons and tons of dirt out every year. Um, and just to uh, put off a question people might ask, it does not fill itself up miraculously. Uh, the priests have workers, they have a giant dirt pile, which they bless. And then the workers take five gallon buckets and fill it back up with dirt to keep uh, you know, the supply going. A high point of my research was on Good Friday one year. I got to dump two five gallon buckets in there myself. So I've actually put more in the hole than I've taken. All right. Well, that's not the only origin story though. Uh, the Tewa speaking Pueblos of the region for many years have had a story of two giants that were fighting each other here at this place and they slew each other and their blood dripped down into the earth creating springs. And those springs and the mud from those springs were thought to have healing properties for, for many, many years. We don't know how long. Uh, another reason that this site then was holy for the Tewa was not only because of these healing properties of the mud and dirt there, but also because the hill behind where the Santuario right now is, you can see to the, the, the side of it, uh, is this hill that in Tewa is called Simayo, the name of the town. Um, if you go on a hill across from it, you can take a, I took this picture looking down, you can see the hill is quite large, it rises behind the church. And in the Tewa worldview, uh, this is one, uh, the Chimayo is an entrance into the Tewa underworld and is one of the four cardinal points um, of their world. Uh, and so we can also imagine that the hole itself in the ground is one of the ways you could get down into that world uh, from whence this entire reality emerged at some point. So that also is an origin story for the healing dirt. And finally, there is also a Guatemalan origin for this. In 16th uh, century, the late 1500s in Guatemala, in a little village in eastern Guatemala called Esquipulas, uh, the Spanish evangelizers built this beautiful crucifix. And over the years, the skin turned from alabaster white to the dark color that you see today. And it's understandably called the Cristo Negro de Esquipulas. And the people, the Mayan people actually, who lived around in the region, had had a long tradition of also eating dirt from around the area, these little clay tablets that they'd made. This is a practice that anthropologists call geophagy. Well, this, this devotion to Esquipulas went like wildfire, and it spread south of there and also north. And lo and behold, when, when Bernardo Beto was asked to name the crucifix that he found, he called it the Lord of Esquipulas. And here we have this healing dirt and this devotion to Esquipulas spreading throughout New Spain as well. So it's really hard to nail down exactly what the story is here, but a lot of complicated factors are going together. Again, both indigenous and Spanish Catholic inputs are bringing this tradition to life. So what are the issues when we study this example of Mexican-American religious healing? First of all, where does the healing come from? Does it come from the crucified Christ, the sort of biblical image of Christ that we have, hanging on the cross as a supplicant, as the, the perfect mediator between heaven and earth, uh, as a healer, as the great physician, as the Catholic uh, administrators of the site would have us believe. Well, that would be great, and, and that's what they would like us to think. But the thing is, a few decades after Esquipulas was discovered in the ground and set up as kind of the, the patron of the church, uh, the Santo Nino arrived on the scene. And he is 
a million times more popular among people in New Mexico than Esquipulas ever dreams he'll be. This Christ child, who's not biblical, uh, but captures the imagination and it means so much to parents and to other people seeking well-being, they think that the dirt is related to the blessing of the Santo Niño. And they're not really interested in this whole official story about Abeta and the crucifix. They are interested in the healing that comes from the Christ child through the dirt. And then finally, we have the dirt itself. Uh, and I had a lot of uh, encounters with people who are devoted to this place, and I would say, well, uh, where does the healing come from? Well, it comes from God. Okay, so would it be okay if we didn't have the dirt? No, 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 we must have the dirt. <laughs> the dirt is, is essential. The, the dirt is the material through which wherever the healing comes from, it necessarily comes through this dirt of this particular place, this Tewa place, this Catholic place, this colonial place. It's important. Another issue is the question of what I've called religious ownership. Who owns the santuario? Well, actually, the Catholic Church owns the, the actual deed to the land. Now they own it. Uh, but also, the Nuevo Mexicanos, the people from the land who have lived there for generations, feel a claim of ownership to it. But so do all the tourists who come there. Millions of tourists have been there and also have felt healed there have felt seen and encountered and, and spiritually connected there in a way that they feel like it's a place where they also belong. Uh, but there's still a lot of fighting about who it belongs to. And, and this here is a map, uh, kind of a very amusement park style map that the local parish has put together and uses all over the site right now, which has offended a lot of local people because it seems to minimize their, the place they find to be so important to them, so sacred. So again, the issues are similar to curanderismo. To whom does a religious devotion belong? And in this case, to whom does a healing tradition belong? Does it belong to every Catholic all over the world? Is it only for Nuevo Mexicanos or is it only for Pueblos? Is it for anyone who comes to seek it and is seeking healing? Who does this belong to? All right, part three, and this one's shorter. So I'm just getting started on this research project. Uh, it's a new project. I hope will also maybe result in some sort of publication eventually. Uh, I'm researching public health and public health initiatives in the mid 20th century. Public health initiatives were developing throughout the border region in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, they were trying to improve health outcomes for Mexican Americans. But when they study, if you read these old public health initiatives, if you read their plans, if you read their data, you find that when they studied Mexican-American contexts, they were literally obsessed with Mexican-American religion. That's all they want to talk about, these anthropologists and, and public health researchers. Uh, they, they considered it to be a fully blown healthcare tradition. And because of that, they considered it to be a significant barrier to scientifically based care and treatment. So I'm hoping my project will examine public health initiatives in this time period that sought to treat infectious diseases, really bad ones like tuberculosis, and also sought to treat psychiatric diseases among Mexican Americans and understand better what's happening in, that, in those studies, in those initiatives. I wanted to share with you a few of the sources I've started to find, uh, starting with this one here from um, an anthropologist who was working in South Texas in the early 60s, uh, and he wrote this. The conservative Latin worldview follows the common folk pattern of blending the supernatural and the natural in one integrated system. Although the Anglo may be a devout church member, he usually distinguishes clearly between supernatural and natural phenomena. The scientific isolation of the natural world is incomprehensible to the conservative Mexican-American Usually a Roman Catholic, he tends to view the Anglo belief as part of the Protestant heresy. Even continuous attempts by the Catholic clergy to educate the lower class Latins to the basic concepts of the modern medicine usually fail. Or Catholicism is bad. <laughs> okay, particularly Mexican-American Catholicism. Here's another example from another anthropologist writing a little later about villages in northern New Mexico. And she says of her own research, the study was designed to secure sociocultural information that would be helpful to professional persons in the United States working with people 
of Mexican background who have not yet been fully assimilated into American culture. So if Catholicism, particularly Mexican math, American Catholicism, is backward and unhealthy, then the answer, of course, is assimilation to American culture. And in many of these sources, they use the terms scientific and Anglo synonymously. So I'm, I'm trying to understand that. And just to share quickly, uh, my hope, my desired objectives for this project, we'll see where it goes, is to contribute to historical perspectives on changing health norms in Mexican-American communities, to understand how Mexican-American healthcare has been construed as pathological in biomedical and public health settings, and also to consider the process where scientific legitimation of some religious practices which work, quote unquote work, uh, you know, their herbal remedies or, or talk therapies or something that have some sort of scientific basis are scientifically legitimated. And in, in legitimating these practices in that way, they subtly differentiate good religion from bad or superstitious religion. And then what gets left to the people as part of their religious traditions are only the superstitious parts. The other parts have kind of been sucked up into public health initiatives in some ways, which is, I don't, it, it sounds so bad that I'm saying, and I think it, it, there are some very negative parts to this. On the other hand, these public health initiatives saved a lot of lives and uh, made people healthier in, in many ways. So it's, it's a complicated question, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into it. So let me get to my conclusions. I'm sure you're ready for that. Uh, I have five of them. First, the origins of Mexican-American religious healing lie in the creative combinations of Iberian Catholic and indigenous traditions. This seems like a no-brainer to me. There's definitely this combination happening. Two, the power to heal exists in the tension between divine power and physical material, whether that be dirt or herbs or images or water, lots of things. But physical things and divine power work together to heal. This one I didn't talk about as much in my talk, but trust me, this is a good conclusion. Healing is deeply tied to being protected from harm. Mexican-American religious healing is also about prevention, not only about treating a crisis. Mexican-American religious healing is not a closed system and never has been. C.1. It's a combination of traditions. And finally, and I'm still working on this one, the interface between Mexican-American religion and biomedical health care has a complicated history that has led to the redefinition of what Mexican-American religious healing is. Uh, so much so that I think if I were to give this talk in, let's say, 50 or 100 years, I might have to change number one to include uh, Iberian Catholic indigenous traditions and biomedical health healthcare as the, the main components of Mexican American religious healing. Finally, I'll say that I think the folks here that I've met at the University of Arizona and some of whom will be on the panel here shortly have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the breadth and depth of their engagement with rich issues of religious, uh, religion and health. And I truly look forward to learning from them and with them for many years. And thank you again for having me. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly introduce um, everyone who's up here. We are so honored to have uh, Dr. Michael Abacasas uh, moderating our panel tonight. He's the Dean of the College of Medicine, uh, Tucson, uh, and, and they've been so gracious to work with us and um, allow us to use this space tonight. Um, we also have um, on the panel, Dr. Ada Wilkinson Lee from the Department of Mexican American Studies. And uh, she, uh, works uh, widely on Latino health, uh, community-based uh, part participatory, participatory action research, and uh, she will bring that perspective as a, a public health advocate and uh, the community here. Uh, unfortunately, two of our original panelists have, um, one, uh, Christy Slominski was going to be on the panel, and she is ill today. 
Felina Cordova, Cordova Marx was going to be on the panel and her tire blew out on the way here and it uh, doesn't look like she's going to make it. Um, but I'm jumping in on the panel myself. Uh, um, my own research looks at the history of American evangelicals and the impact of conservative American evangelicalism on public health discourses. So I will join the panel and um, talk about that if, if that comes up. And I will turn it over to uh, Dean Abacassis now to guide us through our discussion. Well, thank you. And uh, I, uh, I think I speak for all of us. Um, two uh, very inspiring, uh, very different, but very inspiring talks. Um, um, so uh, there are some questions that have been uh, prepared for the panel. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we're hoping to get some questions from the audience uh, through the QR mechanism. So uh, I'd like to get started. Uh, and again, this is for whoever uh, feels uh, they, they would like to answer the question first. How does research and scholarship in the humanities and the social sciences contribute to public health, which was alluded to, medicine, and wellness? Uh, well, I can speak to it from a social science perspective. Um, I think that from a social science perspective, it's really important to be culturally aware of uh, the historical and cultural context when it comes to uh, public health, medicine, and wellness. And what we do is um, with our research team is we really do try to focus on bringing a holistic approach to health and well-being and um, integrating that cultural responsiveness from the community, right? And we recognize that the community is a very heterogeneic community. So not making assumptions about the community at all, but really getting to know the community. And when I talk about um, interventions in the community or even um, create co-creating uh, research with the community, it's always with the community instead of creating um, research, you know, about the community or using the community, right? So we, uh, our approach is very community-based driven and our community um, members are our community research partners. So actively engaging the community. And we really see ourselves as technical assistant vehicles Right, to bring in maybe the grants or to talk about like how to go about getting those grant proposals and bringing the money to the community. But it's really the community that drives um, the topic area and really talking about not so much focusing on disease specific approaches, but recognizing that the community are the ones that are going to indicate what the focus should be. And then we um, provide the assistance to then facilitate the best optimal outcome for the community. So uh, being able to bring in a very holistic, complex approach um, to public health and, and medicine and wellness is really paramount um, to making sure that we're not short-sighting the community or like uh, Brett showed in, in some of those um, examples uh, for his third study or as he's moving forward is the very... Um, simplistic or even uh, making those kind of stereotypical assumptions about a community and not um, fully engaging the community and the complexity of each community. So that's what we strive for. And I think that um, it's best when it's done from an um, inner a disciplinary approach. Maybe I'll just pick up on that and talk about that's about the humanities as well. So much of what we train students to do in the humanities is to think about the complexity and um, place that in historical context to see how things change over time, how different cultures come together and shape each other. And so whatever profession they go into, uh, including health professions, um, humanities studies, including religious studies, which is such an interdisciplinary field, as you've seen from um, the example of Dr. Hendrickson's talk, um, students learn to think critically and put their assumptions aside and look at the world from different perspectives. Um, and I think that makes them better practitioners and clinicians when they go into health professions and thinking about their patients and you know, treating them as whole people um, with those, those critical thinking skills, those cultural competency skills that they get in the, the humanities and social sciences. 
And Doc, I've spoken a fair amount, but just two real quick things. I think another thing that the humanities does is think about wellness, not merely as wellness of one patient, but wellness of the, the context, the, the family, the community that, that the patient lives in, and maybe even the nation, uh, that healing can be a, a very social thing for the, the body politic. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that uh, we really specialize, many of us at least, in narratives and rhetoric, and that one of the ways we can kind of explain is how does religious healing work is it works because stories do things to your bodies and uh, that's something we know about thank you um there's another question here i'm i'm going to kind of throw my own question in uh, <laughs> you give me a podium and a microphone <laughs> um so uh osler who was the father of modern medicine, um, fellow Canadian, started out at McGill. Um, his, my favorite saying, my favorite quote from him is that a good physician uh, treats the disease, but a great physician treats the patient with the disease. So uh, I grew up in Northern Africa uh, and uh, very big influence, Mediterranean influence, Spanish, um, Muslim, Jewish, uh, and then moved to Canada, um, where there was, uh, you know, Canada is known as the mosaic instead of the melting pot, uh, and then moved to the United States. And uh, when you treat a patient with the exact same disease as another patient, um, you have to take their cultural background into account, um, whether uh, it's in diagnosing how serious the condition is. Um, I can tell you that Mediterranean patients, uh, much like um, patients in this part of the country, um, have a different way of showing you that they have pain versus uh, more stoic patients, like Asian patients from um, um, uh, China predominantly, or some of those countries, or um, American, you know, they, people just manifest pain in a different way. So when you're assessing a patient um, and you're trying to decide, uh, so I'm a surgeon, um, patient's got a belly pain, uh, do I operate on this patient or do I just watch them? Uh, a lot of times you have to take that context um, uh, into account. So my question is, uh, you know, as we look at health and we look at all of these aspects, and uh, so I have, you know, there's curanderos, uh, and uh, some people go to card readers, uh, to figure out what their health is like. And there's a whole different set of cultures. So my question is, um, you know, how do you, uh, w when you're looking at all these practices, especially in this part um, of, of the world, you know, how do you determine uh, how much of uh, disease expression is cultural uh, and how much does that affect the potential impact of a curandero versus the impact of Western, more Western, more modern uh, medical treatments? Is that a question that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious. Is that something when you have studied uh, these uh, places where people get care and it's a combination of religious beliefs or cultural traditions versus, you know, medicine or surgery as we know it in parts of the country. How does it all fit in? Is it really uh, what Osler said, you know, don't treat the disease, uh, treat the patient who has the disease. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I, re I really love that quote. That's great. Um, you know, I'm, I'm far from a surgeon, so I, I certainly don't take any medical advice from me. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I, I only play one on the post. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say that, yeah, it's, it's really important. Uh, I think nowadays, one of the things that a, a curandero can do is 
is work as an as an adjunct and as a partner with other forms of of healthcare delivery with with the surgeon with maybe a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, and be sort of an intermediary in a way that we might consider kind of a social worker, a chaplain mm -hmm. in a healthcare setting as another professional uh, that would be a really welcome, I think, addition to like the healthcare team to help people heal the patient, not just the, you know, the disease. Right. Um, also, I mean, I, historically, I mean, I, I'm mostly an historian. Um, there were ways too, and particularly with psychiatric illnesses where, uh, religious healers from the tradition were far more successful than outside psychiatrists. Um, you know, I think of some cases, uh, and I think it, it goes to precisely some of the things you're saying that, um, the, the, the definition of wellness in that case differed so radically that mm -hmm. they were you know, kind of crossing objectives for the patient and that, you know, didn't one work better than the other. Yeah. And just one thought I've had is, you know, someone who studies conservative evangelicals and now you see a lot in these communities with opposing vaccines or vaccine hesitancy. And uh, I think one thing religious studies helps us some, pushes us to think through is there may be a really good scientific medical solution, but you've got to get buy-in for, for it to work. You know, you've got to find where people are at and figure out how to talk to them um, for them to, to make use of, of these wonderful sort of modern medical miracles. Um, so how, you know, that's part of the conversation is how, how do we, how do we, integrate those conversations so that people can make use of, of the amazing modern Western medicine we have. Right. I think, I think from our perspective, um, the integration of promotoras or community health workers have been um, instrumental with our community because some of the, the um, research findings that we have found in our, with our team is that people are always complaining about the lack of time, right. And, the, and how rushed, um, the Western medicine is and, and how they only have five, 10 minutes with the doctor. And so they feel that they can't build that rapport and they can't maybe be, be as open about uh, the assessment or the diagnosis of how to go into the comprehensive and the thoroughness of what's happening in there with them. Right. And so, um, by having promotoras integrated into the healthcare system, you're building that rapport with the promotora. And then the promotora is then, um, advocating and helping guide that patient to the needed services that they need. And so um, they're able to open up more and to maybe provide more um, transparency about maybe some of those religious beliefs that are happening or some of these things where, oh, you know, I've used this type of remedy um, and it's not working. I want to know why. Sometimes um, patients may feel like they can't disclose that information to a medical provider because they think that they're going to be treated um, you know, um, unjustly, or they're going to be made fun of, or um, there's going to be a, a certain perspective of the, the patient if they disclose that information. So I think um, our system really needs to be more integrated and to provide, like you said, the social workers um, as the support team so that we can really have a comprehensive view of each patient, right? So instead of um, focusing on the disease specifically, you're focusing on the needs of that specific uh, patient. Right. And in incorporating those cultural aspects of it. Right. So, so I, I agree. And, and I think the, the lesson is that none of these disciplines can take care of the problem for a particular patient without working as a team. And I think what you brought up in your lecture was the fact that these are very essential team members, whether it's religious beliefs or, you know, people that have traditional cures that, you know, again, it's Osler. You know, the same disease can be treated many different ways in different patients. So thank you. I appreciate that. And sorry for going off script. Um, so back on script. Uh, so following up on, on Dr. Uh, Hendrickson's lecture, um, I would like to ask the panel to discuss how the histories and cultures of Mexican-Americans help to inform best practices when it comes to public health and medicine in Arizona and beyond. And then let me add a little bit of my own, right? So I wonder, you've studied, um, um, you, you've studied your field in this area very, very deeply. 
And I wonder if you were to draw parallels in other parts of the world uh, that have not the same histories, but similar histories over the centuries. You know, what, what are the parallels? I mean, what is specific to this part of the world? And what does what you've studied in this part of the world have in common with what may be happening in, you know, Africa or in other parts of the world? And I'm sure somebody has studied that. Somebody has looked at what are the commonalities? Yeah. I should I should really pass the Arizona question on to people who know more about the Arizona context. Or New sure, Mexico. But, I mean, yeah, it's, New Mexico, yeah, but Southwest. The, yeah. I mean, I think in a word, really, it's just colonialism. Um, you know, the the idea that and colonialism by that I mean taking other people's resources and land in a way that also makes sure that that system remains in place through racializing people. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that racialization is also saying that their traditions, their religions, their customs are less than, that are, they need to be replaced, uh, that they will be better and healthier and more productive citizens if they take on the values of the colonizer. And I think that dynamic is, it makes people sick, uh, like generationally sick. Um, I, I know when we talked about this before, uh, in sort of a warm up for this event, we talked about the role that historical trauma plays is is real and is I think part of the reason that curanderismo and that these other sorts of devotions exist in some ways are to treat people who are suffering from that kind of trauma. Like a, 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 a thing that Mexican Americans say a lot and I really, really love is la cultura cura, like culture cures. And uh, I mean, I think that's that's a reclamation of agency, of joy, of purpose of value and i think that's something that happens in in a lot of contexts where colonialism has has been an historical factor i think to add to what brett said i think you're correct and and that whole notion of colonization and historical trauma um you know impacting generations of people uh, moving forward but what we're trying to do is also integrate a more acid-based approach to health now of recognizing what works within the culture, what has been resilient across the country for generations and generations, and how can we tap into whether those are cultural um, factors, whether that's uh, built in over the years of struggle, and really tapping into that and, and giving ownership to the community to state, you know, this is the best way, this is the best approach to this um, situation. And looking at, I think what COVID has done for us is um, put a global um, view of social determinants of health at the forefront to show the in in inequities that are happening at all different levels of society and to show how minoritized communities are really impacted by uh, COVID. And so um, that in itself is showing us that we need to recognize those things. We need to recognize the social and structural uh, effects that it has on people, not just the individual, but the community, and then for generations to come. And so recognizing that um, will help us move forward when we talk about communal well-being, um, to move just beyond the individual, to really look at um, how do we best approach a community and um, community input and empowerment is the best way to go of providing that agency to the community to say, this is what we need in order to feel better, to move forward with our agenda. And I think that goes across the board, you know, coming at it from a very social justice perspective of recognizing the structural inequalities in order to move health forward. Mm -hmm. Um. Another, so let's focus on uh, indigenous communities, uh, specifically American Indian sovereign nations in Arizona. Uh, you know, we can talk about uh, colonial, the Spanish, Mexican uh, influence, but um, could you maybe discuss as a panel um, within the indigenous uh, communities, the relationship uh, and maybe some of the differences um, in religion, and culture, uh, so you you know between the two populations in the very same uh, geographic area. 
We do regret that Felina Kadorva Marx is, uh, wasn't able to make it. She would have been the perfect person to address this. And she, she just said to feel free to share her information with people if they'd like to discuss these things with her um, more directly. And she's a professor of public health here at U of A and specializes in that very topic. But I think the two of you might have something to say about. Well, um, with our research projects, we do um, have co-partners uh, with um, researchers within the sovereign, different sovereign nations. And so what we do is we want, want to make sure that we don't speak for each sovereign nation, but we allow each sovereign nation to speak for themselves. So we don't make assumptions about uh, what works with the Latine community is going to work in the same way with uh, Pascua Yaki or Tona Atom, but rather what um, we do is we engage as a, as a team to come up with specific targeted approaches for each community, recognizing the heterogeneous uh, nature of each community so that we're not creating these kind of cook cookie cutter approaches and saying like, oh, these are all communities of color, so this is all gonna work within this community. Um, and um, we also have a very iterative process where everything that we do is vetted through the community. So we never put anything out until the community vets, whether that's through a community action board or uh, bringing together uh, listening sessions to have them look at the language that's being put out there, um, the images that are being put out there so that there is um, agreement among all the community members before we move anything forward. Because as we have seen time and time again in history, and even research that has been done in the past, some of that research can be very hurtful and very uh, dangerous to different sovereign nations. And what we're trying to do is doing it from an ethical standpoint, where we're not continuing to um, to cause that hurt or that misinformation or disinformation within the community. So we recognize our role uh, as, again, technical assistance, but we never put forth anything without um, the shared governance of the sovereign nations. Yeah, so, so I think uh, what you're saying, which uh, makes a lot of sense, and I'll give you my own personal experience on this, uh, is that, um, it's important to recognize that different cultures are going to have different perspectives. And um, the solution for all is really to know what those cultural differences are and to address them. Uh, and addressing them will be different, right? Depending, even within uh, Native nations, the different tribes may have different perspectives. And so I'll just give you a, a little anecdote. So uh, I spent 30 years at Northwestern um, and led one of the biggest transplant programs in the country. And uh, about 15 years ago, so Chicago has the fourth largest Hispanic population in the United States. 95% uh, is uh, from Mexico. And so I was getting pretty tired of um, treating all patients the same so I speak Spanish fluently, uh, but I'm not Hispanic in terms of coming from uh, Central or, or South America. And so uh, I could deal with the language issue when we had Hispanic patients. Um, but it was clear that Hispanic patients came to our clinics and when they were 20% of the clinic uh, and they had a translator uh, speaking to them as opposed to everybody else, um, they really did not, in my opinion, feel like they were getting the same attention. So we created the first Hispanic transplant program in the country. And uh, we hired Hispanic social workers, uh, Hispanic surgeons, Hispanic nephrologists, and uh, we dedicated the clinics. Uh, so one day a week, our clinics were only for Hispanic patients. And we studied it. And uh, we wanted to have, at the time, we wrote a grant for HRSA and then NIH grants. And we said, we need to have a culturally competent and culturally congruent clinic. It's not just the language, you know. And we learned a lot. Uh, we learned a ton, um, for example, and I'm not generalizing, but these were findings that were published. Um, we found, for example, that the decision maker uh, in most Hispanic families 
was not the patient. Uh, it was usually the matriarch of the family. And so we made sure that the matriarch was there when we were doing our education on transplant. Um, we, uh, we found that there was a, a mistrust of specialists, but an incredible trust in what they called the head doctor, who was a family doctor. So instead of communicating with a nephrologist, we would communicate with the uh, primary care physician, who was usually had large Hispanic patients. We found that the church had a huge influence. So we went to the churches and in fact, we had a one of the priests donate a kidney to one of the parishioners and all of a sudden the, the living donor rate shot up in that church because there were beliefs that that was against the Catholic religion, whereas in turn, the Pope had said that this was an important thing to do. So we learned a lot of things and we were able to increase access to transplant to Hispanic community, living donor rates. I mean, all metrics skyrocketed, which meant that a lot of lives were saved, okay? So then we decided to have a focus on the African-American community. Uh, and we said, well, we have the playbook. We know how to do this. We're gonna you know, try to do this. And what we found uh, was that the problems were very similar, but they were very different. And so uh, just looking at two different populations in the city of Chicago, uh, we found that the issues that were keeping patients from getting transplanted and, and saving them from dying, uh, the solution, it was the same, it was identifying that cultures were different but they were different in different populations. So it wasn't like you could say, okay, I got it. You know, it was, so I think that, you know, the point that you were making is that even within native nations, um, you know, their perspectives are going to have to be very specific. And which means that the approach to providing care, the approach to providing wellness uh, is very different, even though the, you can come up with a commonality of, well, it's, you know, cultural differences or religious differences, but they're all very different in different populations. Going back to Osler's words about, you know, every patient uh, has, may have the same disease. In our case, kidney failure, but every patient had to be treated. Every kidney disease had to be treated in the patient who had the kidney disease. So I appreciate your comments. Um, I'm sure there are questions from the audience that you've been accumulating. So, uh, how yes, are we, we doing do, on we do time? We do have several questions submitted, uh, but maybe um, one or two, and then pass it back for some final thoughts. But um, we'll go with one here. Um, how do you envision that traditional Hispanic me medical practices might change, if at all, in response to a younger generation that brings their own blend of spirituality, typically rooted to worldly and diverse experiences, and a virtual world now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I mean, one of the things that's that's important to note in younger populations of uh, Latinx people is that the rate of leaving religion or reporting non-affiliation with religion is absolutely identical with the rest of their generational cohort, which is about you know twenty percent. Uh, and so the the question is though, merely not reporting an affiliation doesn't mean that suddenly you've lost like your entire religious cultural background. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, the other thing that I think hopefully is happening, uh, you know, I see it with my own kids, is that, you know, that there is a greater communication between different kinds of people in our marriage, all kinds of things that would allow for new mixtures to take place. Um, at the same time, I think, I mean, I was just listening to Dr. Wilkerson Lee here, and I'm just thinking, wow, gosh, I wish that this is the process that we've been following for the last 500 years. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited to see what sort of really holistic and, and powerful health is going to be happening in communities across the country with the kind of this approach of, of working, um, you know, so this iterative process with, with communities. Um, if that's being done with the younger generation, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Hopefully really good things. I also think that um, the younger generation of Latinx um, individuals are also moving more towards traditional healing. And so they're seeking out the traditional healing look that not only from 
a healing perspective from the, from from a spiritual perspective as well. So um, they're really wanting to know and go back to their indigenous roots. So not making the assumption that when you're talking to the younger generation that they're all Catholic or Protestant, uh, but we're seeing a mixture of all of these different religious and spiritual um, rituals that are being mixed and blended. And so we see, um, and we're also seeing more advocacy and, and they're more sp outspoken because they know they're more well-versed in how to um, advocate for themselves. And we see that advocacy even within the family setting when they're going in um, you know, with their their older parents or with their grandparents uh, and, and really advocating for what needs to be done in the healthcare system. And we just have to remember that um, the use of traditional um, remedies um, has come about because of their accessibility in the community and the accessibility to the materials. And so oftentimes people say, well, why are they using that approach? It's because there has been that those barriers sometimes to uh, Western medicine. And so there show, is showing the resiliency of the community, how the community is um, trying to counteract a, a challenge in the community and how do we go about it when well, it's coming around by um, you know, advocating for themselves by show, um, using some of these um, remedies that have been to be effective in a traditional sense in order to move the community forward. So really looking at it from a communal perspective. A, um, I don't know if it's a direct follow, but, but fairly related. Um, how do you balance the oral traditions of Hispanic healing practices with the increased accessibility provided by online Corandero schools? How do you legitimately train traditional healers? through a virtual format? Yeah, that's, that's a, I, I love that question because, you know, it, it, not to, to I, I can't ask the questioner back exactly what they mean. Uh, you know, how do, what makes a, a virtual space less legitimate than like a face-to-face -face training is a, is a question I think that the virtual trainers would ask. Um, you know, it's, we do a lot of things on, on the internet now. And uh, I think that you can, totally learn how to be a curandera that way. Uh, now, whether you'll still need a lot of practical <laughs> training, I mean, like that goes without saying, but um, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's something that, that we've been dealing with in, in American religious history for a long time, going back to the 19th century, where um, spiritualists would heal people through the mail, you know? Um, so I think that as our technologies change um you know people will definitely use those technologies to continue their traditions in in creative ways and there's some more but i think I'll, I'll pass it back to you for maybe a, a sure. final question or to kind of frame some some wrap-up thoughts um well i wonder if uh, i know we don't want to pass a microphone around uh, but I wonder if somebody maybe with a loud voice that has a question could ask a question from the audience. Anybody have um, uh, a, a question they would like to ask? Because we're getting pretty close to 8 o'clock, so we only really have time for maybe one more question if anybody has one. So you're talking about the Hispanic paradox. Yes. yes. I've, I've always uh, I've been very interested in that. Uh, from a medical perspective, but I, I love the question in terms of how does that juxtapose with some of the more traditional. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because the Hispanic paradox shows that um, Latinx communities have um, better um, um, yeah, outcomes, outcomes yeah. than um, they should, given all of the challenges that they face, right? Uh, lower economic status, lower educational attainment in general, right? Um, so we, we have a lot of um, uh, characteristics that would put them, that you would think would put them at a disadvantage, and yet they're doing better. Um, and many people say it's cultural, right? So if they're coming in and they're coming into ethnic enclaves, then um, those cultural components um, are going to help um, counteract some of the negative uh, cultural, social factors. But recent uh, 
studies that are coming out are actually showing that as um, Latine come in to this community, that they're also migrating to different areas. They're not coming to the traditional areas where there's a high concentration of, let's say, Mexican or Mexican-American communities. So that would dictate that the hypothesis would say, like, those that are going to areas where there's less Latino community, they're not going to do as well. And what the findings are actually showing is that they're doing better than the ones that are moving into ethnic enclaves. The reason behind it is that they're saying that because they're moving into these um, new right, uh, geographic locations that aren't typically supporting um, Latina communities like Los Angeles or Tucson or Phoenix, um, is because it has an economic, an economic driver behind it. So these communities are welcoming of the migrants that are coming in to take those um, jobs. And so the infrastructure that is in place is more welcoming than if you're going into a community where there's more microaggressions and discrimination, right? So like if you're having someone coming in from Mexico, coming into, let's say, Tucson, where we have uh, some interesting laws in place and where we have, you know, um, you know, a ban on ethnic studies and all these things, you're, you're coming into a community where you might be dealing with a lot of more uh, stressors, day-to-day -day stressors. Whereas um, going into new communities, that infrastructure is a place where it's welcoming um, and that there is more infrastructure in place to kind of offset and continue that Hispanic paradox. So the the, the research is always changing, right? Because we used to say ethnic enclaves, that's the way to go. Um, but now the new, the new uh, research that's coming out is saying, no, actually, um, it's all about like the infrastructure that is put in place to allow people to do well in that environment. So if it's a welcoming environment, they're more likely to do well, even if the population numbers are lower. I'll just say that's fascinating, and I'm so glad to know that. Uh, and that I honestly, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know how to answer your question about the whether um, religious healing traditions are helping or not. I don't, I honestly don't know. I guess that's why it remains a paradox. Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, we're uh, past the hour, and uh, I don't know if you want to close it off. Uh, um, I, I. I uh, want to thank you all for joining us for our very first uh, Fred and Barbara Borga uh, Religion and Health Lecture. I think it was a wonderful evening. So, so many fascinating uh, conversations and important conversations. Um, thank you also for bringing in your perspective and, and experiences, uh, which really enriched our conversation. Um, we wish you all a, a wonderful evening and um, safe travels back to, back to your home and, and your dorms. Thank you so much. <laughs>